so, so delighted and excited to welcome Dr. Gabriel with us this evening to talk um, to us. So thank you so much for your time. Um, before we get going, some exciting news as well. Tomorrow we are gonna circulate our call for papers um, for the kind of conference that we are planning to run in February. Uh, the conference is titled um, Queer and the Classical Futures and Potentialities, um, Critical Feelings, Critical Futures. Um, so look out for that tomorrow. We'll send that around the mailing list. Um, we're really grateful for the advice and guidance of, uh, for, of Mother Uma Chandran, who's helped guide and shape this call for papers, and also uh, for Nicolette D'Angelo, who will be uh, uh, convening the conference with Eleanor and myself. So exciting news for tomorrow. Um, but before we get there um, this evening, um, we'll be going through the the kind of the same kind of procedures that we've been working with in previous weeks. Um, so as per, this is a kind of safe uh, and open creative space for, for thinking, especially for members of the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, in that spirit, we all wanna kind of invite and I guess cultivate that same sense of respect for each other that we have been using throughout this term. Um, and even though it's virtual again, we're kind of inviting consideration about the ways that we all take up space in the discussion. Um, we're all coming from different backgrounds and areas and stages of life. So we want to kind of, uh, again, kind of make a, a moment to reflect on uh, everyone's thoughts and feelings, everyone's questions and everyone's time too. Uh, so this uh, session this evening, the, the presentation will be recorded um, as it has been previous weeks. Um, so just a heads up on that. Um, we won't again be recording the Q&A portion, but we will be recording the talk. Um, this, again, this presentation will be followed by an open discussion and exchange of ideas. Um, so we invite you to, to both use the raise hand function um, to create an order of participants. Um, you can find that button through Zoom, but I'll go through the kind of the webinar shortcuts as well. Um, so you can use Alt and Y to raise and lower your hand on a Windows or Option and Y to raise your hand or lower your hand on a Mac. Um, please also feel free to type questions or comments that you would like one of us at myself, Eleonora, okay, to read as part of the conversation in the chat at any moment at all. Um, if you have a technical question, please pop a T ahead of that, uh, just so we can kind of spot it out in the chat and, and address that. Um, one last thing again, uh, invite people to put themselves on mute um, while, the, while other people are speaking to reduce any interfering or background noise. And now I'm gonna hand over to Eleonora to introduce our speaker this week. Great, so um, we're very excited this week for the speaker. Uh, so Kay Gerber is a writer, teacher, and organizer. Uh, she has received fellowships from the Poetry Project, Lambda Literary, and Princeton University, where she recently completed her PhD in classics. Uh, with Andrea Abikaram, she's the co-editor of We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans poetics, which I have now, and it's an amazing book, so I encourage everyone to buy it and read it. Uh, and she's also the author of Kissing Other People or The Owls of Fame, of Rosa Press 2021 for coming. And final recent work in Social Text, the Transgender Studies Quarterly, Invert, and the LA Review of Books. Um, Kay lives in Queens, New York. So we're very excited. I mean, for the, I guess, potentialities that the pandemic is allowing us to have by having her here tonight. And I'm gonna leave it over to her now. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you, Lenora. Thank you, Marcus. Um, can everyone hear me? Being not, so I'm going to assume yes. Great. Wonderful. Um, hi, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, calling you from Occupied and uh, in Queens. Um, uh, I hope everyone is keeping safe and well. Um, it's also wonderful to see many friends, and I was not expecting that. Um, so I hope that this will be fun. I'm kind of winging it. I have some notes. Um, but, uh, a friend yesterday was like, why don't you just do a David Anton and like make it up on the spot? And I was like, well, <laughs> what if? Um, <clears throat> but, but the topic is more serious than that. So, so, so that, you know, like we're, we're going to treat it with, with some of the seriousness it deserves. Um, okay. So I guess that my plan for tonight, and I'm, I'm going to talk for like, 25 to 30 minutes. Um, and then I hope that we can really get into this discussion. I'm looking forward to that. I'm part going to talk some and I'm going to read some and, you know, we'll go back and forth depending. The thing I want to talk about tonight um, is a situation that I believe is 
widespread um, in the discipline. I'm not really going to be talking about futures and potentialities. I am going to be talking about the recent past and some of its failures. <laughs> but, but sort of in the hope that um, we can do better collectively um, uh, 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 in future and hopefully shortly. Um, so the aim of my talk today is to identify a problem in how classics as a discipline thinks about gender variance in the ancient world. It's rather too broad a goal to address in general, but I suspect that the problem I have in mind is very widespread. Um, and, 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 and it is the following, that as scholars, as we address gender and sexuality in the ancient world, which is you know, something that a critical field that has been going for sort of 40 or 50 years now, um, and, and, I think is, and I think is continuing, this seminar series is one of the signs that it's continuing, it's one of the signs that it's vibrant. As we do so, we are very good, I think, at historicizing the objects of our critique, but not our methods, okay? The objects, but not the methods of our critique. And one of the ways that this appears has specifically to do with, the, uh, with how we treat and understand uh, um, specifically uh, instances of what we might describe as some kind of trans feminine uh, uh, experience. I realize that that's sort of a provisional term, it's a little bit anachronistic, but like bear with me, in the textual record, in poetry, in drama, in history, in the medical texts, um, uh, that we do, when we do so, when scholars in classics, and that we is kind of provisional, right? Because that we includes a lot of different people. Uh, 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 of different uh, 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 different social identities and different employment statuses, right? Um, when classicists have done so, right? They, my, my claim is that they have been uh, insufficiently critical of the methods that they bring to, and, and, and of the theory uh, and of the theoretical stances and biases and practices that they bring to this study. Okay, what do I mean by this? I am talking about a specific, a, 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 what, I'm talking about what the scholar Amy Marvin has described as the curiotization, and I will define that, the curiotization of uh, uh, trans experience, of, of something that could be described as trans feminine experience uh, um, within the objects of our critique. Um, I am not sort of asserting to be clear, I'm not asserting that, you know, when we talk about, as I will talk about tonight, Pentheus, you know, or when we talk about Tiresias, that, that this kind of like meaningfully falls into some kind of trans historical category of trans identity, that is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying though, is that scholars, even when they do not use that language, nonetheless approach uh, 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 this uh, um, kind of these textual moments or these historical moments from a perspective that is informed by 20th century, 19th century, 20th century, and 21st century theory about trans people and trans identity, and particularly about trans women, right? Uh, 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 particularly about the kind of the spectacle, the spectacle of, of, of trans feminine experience. Um, and this tradition, this scholarly tradition, um, begins in sexology. It begins with people like Magnus Hirschfeld. It begins a little bit earlier. It begins with Freud, right? Uh, it, it, it travels through sexology down through the 20th century um, into uh, uh, um, uh, various kinds of um, pathologizing uh, um, uh, schools of thought about trans experience. It travels into so-called uh, uh, radical feminism, anti-trans radical feminism, um, and, and it has all of these, uh, it, it is for, for a century, for fully a century, it was the dominant, these various strains were the dominant way of thinking about trans people, and they are sort of being actively read and studied by a number of different mm, researchers, writers, cultural producers, scholars, including classicists, right? Um, nonetheless, uh, those people are insufficiently critical of, have been insufficiently critical of uh, uh, how that particular form of understanding has inflected the way that they talk about gender variance in the ancient world, okay? This results in, so I, this, now I'm going to go back to the word I said I was going to define, this results in uh, the curiotization of trans identity. What does Amy Mar Marvin mean by this? 
The curio, she says, is an object that is removed from its context, it is alienated from its context, and produced as an object of fascination but not understanding. Okay, I'll say that again. Fascination but not understanding. Uh, another way to think about this is, as the scholar Trish Salah has argued, uh, that much writing about trans people and trans experience takes us as the objects but not the subjects of discourse, okay? Objects but not the subjects of discourse. I'm repeating myself because I think people, like, historically have not listened. So I will say what I have to say a lot. I'm going to say it twice. Um, uh, and, and again, this inflects even when even when classicists um, do not assert a kind of trans-historical identity, so to speak, across historical, uh, 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 like a kind of trans identity or trans experience or something like this. Nonetheless, uh, these kind of critical methods like come to bear on the object of their study, okay? Um, <clears throat> so now I will shift back towards the text itself uh, uh, that I'm going to be reading from. Um, I'm going to, I made a version of this argument in uh, the review essay of Anne Carson's 2017 translation of Euripides Bacchae that I circulated. So my plan for today is I am going to, um, there we have, you know, about 60 people on this call. I'm going to assume that some people have read it and some people have not read it. So I'm going to summarize it a little bit. And I'm also going to bring out some stuff that I wasn't actually able to talk about in that essay. Um, and then I am going to make, finally, a, 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 an argument where I connect it back to a tradition of understanding Bacchae internal to classics that I think Carson is probably actually very familiar with because it's very canonical and because she was a professional classicist before she became a professional, whatever she is now. Um, uh, uh, and, um, and, and I am going to sort of argue that, um, uh, th that intellectual trends internal to classic kind of produce what I described as ultimately the, like pretty extreme phobia of this text. Um, and that this, in, and that, so, so, and that this in turn reflects, I think in, in general on the discipline itself. Um, uh, uh, this is going to be my kind of critical example. I'm going to focus on this issue of Pentheus in the Bacchae. I don't think that this, that, that the phenomenon that I'm talking about is limited to Pentheus in the Bacchae. Um, uh, but you know, that's sort of going to be, that's like, a, it's, a, it's a fixation for me, right? Okay, so let's, I'm going to pour myself some tea and then let's get going. Let's see if I can do this without pouring hot water over myself. Great, wonderful. Um, okay. So to summarize and reiterate, I circulated this review essay uh, that I wrote about Carson's Bacchae. Her play came out in late uh, uh, 20, oh, wonderful. Thank you to uh, uh, Lena. I do not know you, but you're a badass. Thank you for finding that. Um, it's a great essay, um, and I say that not, I guess now it is in the chat, so I have to say my, when a poem that I wrote was included as the epigraph, so this sounds like me citing myself, but it's not. Uh, <laughs> uh, Amy is a fantastic writer, um, and, and, and I think it is an essay we're, well we're dealing with. Dealing with. Um, uh, uh, Carson's translation came out in late 2017. Um, before that point, it was performed at least once, according to APGRD, uh, uh, in London in 2015 by the Almeida Theatre Company. Uh, I'm certain it's been performed again. Um, I don't know much about that production, which would probably be illuminating, but I do know how Carson and her publisher, New Directions, uh, which for those who don't know, is kind of a legacy U.S. publishing house that uh, publishes modernist literature and literature that continues to do modernism after modernism. I do know how these people chose to represent, to present Euripides play. And I think that there are pieces in here that are extremely illuminating for my purposes. Um, I am uh, uh, just going to, I think that probably most people on this call are familiar with Bacchae, uh, but just in case anyone is not, I will summarize Bacchae. Uh, uh, it is Euripides' latest surviving play. It was performed posthumously in 405 BCE. It narrates the myth of the god Dionysus' arrival in the Greek city of Thebes. Uh, the ruling house of Thebes, governed by his first cousin Pentheus, resists adopting his cult, so he drives the women mad and sends them out of the city to Mount the Siren to observe his ritual practices. And he then engineers the humiliation and demise of Pentheus, and one way he does so is by getting Pentheus thrashingly drunk, causing him to lose his senses, senses 
uh, persuading him to dress in the clothes of a Bacchant, that is to say of a female worshiper of Dionysus, and to spy on the women's rituals on Cathyron. He's discovered and ripped apart by his mother Agave, and the play ends in exile for the city's former rulers, the ones who are not dead. Great. Now, 20th century adaptations of Bacchae have frequently highlighted the elements of suppressed and illicit desire that go into Dionysus's gradual persuasion of Pentheus, whereby the violent ruler is coaxed into willingly participating in his own destruction and effectively sacrifice. So, for instance, the infamous production by Richard Schechner's performance group Dionysus in 69 skipped the roving scene entirely and simply portrayed Dionysus seducing, uh, uh, seducing Pentheus sexually. So Carson's adaptation draws on this particular tradition whereby Pentheus's betrayal or murder or sacrifice, whatever, takes the form of the gradual exposing and revelation of his desire. A narr so a narrative point in the play that could be treated a number of different ways is supposed to become exemplary of one particular dynamic whereby Pentheus exposes himself, so to speak, becoming susceptible to the process of sacrifice through his own unannounced, let's say, repressed and revealed desire. Now, Carson's version specifically rewrites this desire in terms amenable to or even identical with a contemporary representation of trans identity. She or her publisher, with her permission, wrote on the back cover copy that Bacchae is, Bacchae is, quote, Euripides' most subversive play, telling the story of a man who cannot admit he would rather live in the skin of a woman. I want us, as I did not really focus on in my, rev my review, but I want us to note the language here. Pentheus wants to live not as, not, 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 not in the moda, but in the skin of a woman, which already connotes masking, disguise, subterfuge, maybe even the kind of butchery and dismemberment that appears in Psycho or Silence of the Lambs. But he can't admit, right? It is an illicit desire that Dionysus brings to the surface, resulting in Pentheus's humiliation and death. Carson more or less says the same thing in her trans, I kind of argued with um, uh, uh, with my, when I was writing this article, I argued with my advisor about it and he was like, well, she doesn't write the back cover copy of some publisher, her publisher probably wrote it. And I'm like, no, but she signed off on it. She signed off on everything. So like we can attribute it to her as in her capacity as an author. Um, Carson more or less says exactly the same thing in a translator's preface to the Bacchae, which I also circulated. And so she writes, beginnings are special because most of them are fake. The new person you become with that first sip of wine was already there. Look at Pentheus twirling around in a dress, so pleased with his girl guys, he's almost in tears. Are we to believe this desire is new? Why was he keeping that dress in the back of his closet anyhow? So she's done a lot of work here for us, right? She said the word desire. Uh, uh, um, she's kind of like sort of fully put it us into that psychoanalytic register. Um, she's given us this strange phrase, girl guys. Uh, 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 notice also that she has cleverly inserted a closet, the dress in the back of his closet. She's inserted a closet into this passage that Pentheus can conveniently in 20th and 21st century idiom come out of. Showing us all publicly how pleased he, note the pronoun, is with his girl guys. And note once again the connotation of disguise masking surface appearance versus genuine or truthful depth of identity. Hang on one second. Dionysus in this account plays the role of exposing repressed desire. The desire takes the form of what we might name as something akin to, if not entirely identical with, a recognizably trans desire. And its unveiling leads in Carson's account to the violent, in fact, anarchic dissolution of the social. Um, uh, so what does this tell us? Well, in my essay, I trace this line of thinking back to Raymond, Janice Raymond, um, and specifically to the Sappho by Surgery chapter in the Transsexual Empire, which came out in 1979, infamously was dedicated to Adrian Rich for poetry fans out there. Uh, 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 she says specifically that Adrian Rich was, was like was one of the basically authors of her thought on that. So that is something for for you guys to for us all to dwell with. Uh, uh, maybe a a a a um, blight on the memory of Adrian Rich. Okay, I'm gonna go on. Um, uh, specifically the Sapphire Surgery chapter in the Transsexual Empire, 
uh, 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 um, in which in, in Raymond's argument discloses the violence sparked by an illicit and as she says, male incursion into women's social spaces. This is a nugget of basically fascistic political philosophy. Uh, uh, why is it fascistic? So it's fascistic because it, it actually it devolves into an exterminationist argument, right? It, it, these are people. Raymond is someone who, when she says explicitly, believes that transsexuals should not exist. She believes that trans people should not exist, okay? This argument has, you know, of course, like resurfaced recently in the, again, intense politicization of particular trans feminine identity with respect to the use of gender segregated spaces. And I am talking to mostly people in the UK. So you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Um, uh, this has, in fact, mainstreamed in the past five years. Uh, uh, sort of conveniently, the five years since I left the UK, what happened, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> um, uh, and, and um, you know, like, I mean, just, I'm just gonna put this out there. People are gonna die. Um, so like, this is really fucking serious. Um, uh, it's not just culture, right? It's, it, it's, you know, understanding how this stuff circulates and how it is legitimated in every corner of the academy is very important. I'm gonna come back to that. Okay. One of the other conclusions that I pull from Carson's translator's preface and the approach it indicates towards translating Bacchae is that Carson's treatment of Euripides as an avant-garde tragedian, she says this a lot, she is following in a modernist tradition of treating Euripides as already a modernist, right? Um, uh, in her version, it depends on her reading of transsexuality in Bacchae, which generates the appropriate level of subversive, as she says, theater. Now, the phobic and we, e we can even say pretty nakedly bigoted nature of this representation should be pretty clear. And if anyone doesn't believe me, when I wrote this essay, people did not believe me, okay? People did not want to believe that Anne Carson, who is a celebrated translator of ancient Greek literature, um, who is beloved by queers because she wrote Autobiography of Red, people did not want to believe me that she is a transphobe, right? But it's in the text, okay? And she translates, you know, Euripides Orestes, um, in her book, An Oresteia, and she refers to the Trojan slave as a sort of hysterical Venus extravaganza, uh, the Latina trans woman and ballroom drag performer who was murdered during the filming of Paris's Burning. So like, you know, I don't really think that she thinks of us as people. I think that she thinks of us as spectacles. I'm just gonna put that out there. And if anybody doubts it, her latest book, Float, includes a pronoun joke, like of all cheap shots, you know? So like, it's, again, it's really fucking serious. Um, okay, sorry. I want to note a couple of striking effects that I didn't really remark on in the essay itself. One is, again, this dynamic that uh, uh, perceives and in fact insists on desire and repression as a central motor of narrative in the Bacchae. I'm not offering des desire and repression as a central motor of the Bacchae narrative, right? I am not offering a reading against this trend necessarily, although I don't agree with it, but I want us to recognize it as a choice in Carson's version, a highly tendentious one, right? Which rewrites the play in terms of Pentheus's perversion. In other words, the reading of desire and repression produces the sensationalism and spectacle, the curiotization, right, of Pentheus's downfall. Discovering transsexual desire hidden in the Bacchae's closet, her word, produces the curiotization that I brought up before. So when Carson writes her translation of Pentheus's final lines before he dies, what a luxury, she says, now you're spoiling me or even my mother, right? We glimpse a pornotroped image of a failed transsexual on her way to a spectacular death, one that Carson has in mind elsewhere when she describes the, uh, 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 the tr when she compares the Trojan slave in Europe these Orestes to, again, a hysterical Venus extravaganza. The second effect that I want to raise and that I didn't talk about in the essay is the fact that Carson's reading of Baca in terms of, as she would put it, a man's desire to enjoy a female costume, a girl guy's to live in the skin of a woman uh, uh, emerges pretty directly out of a highly canonical tradition about the Bacchae itself internal to classics. And for an example of, and the critical text within this tradition, we can turn to Froma Zeitlin's classic essay, Play and the Other, which I excerpted and distributed also. <clears throat> Zeitlin's essay is a canonical work within the meta-theatrical tradition of interpreting Bacchae. This line of thinking seizes on the centrality of Dionysus to the play to argue that Bacchae is among other things, a play about Greek theater itself, performed at a festival sacred to the god that Bacchae represents on stage. In Helena Foley's terms, Euripides and Bacchae closed a career of increasingly manipulative and illusion-breaking treatment of dramatic conventions by presenting us in the Bacchae with a fantasy theatrical Dionysus. Zeitlin finds in Bacchae a figure for Greek drama as a medium, and in so doing, its intimate relationship to a particularly Greek psychodrama of gender, and I invoke psychology because Zeitlin does too. 
For Zeitlin, the climax of Baca occurs through, and I'm quoting, quote, two males, cousins in fact, through their genealogical ties, both engaged in a masculine contest for supremacy. One, however, gains mastery by manipulating a feminized identity, and the other is vanquished when he finally succumbs to it. She continues, what we might perceive in their ensemble at the moment when the two males appear together on stage in similar dress is an instructive spectacle of the inclusive functions of the feminine in the drama. What's important for Zeitlin is that the feminine here on either side is a tool wielded by men, just as more generally women were only represented on the Athenian stage by men. And therefore the excesses of femininity represented in Greek tragedy, tragedy cumulatively are part of, so to speak, a sentence that men speak about themselves to themselves. That, to the extent that tragedy is a feminized art form, and Zeitlin believes that this is very much the case, it is not meaningfully an art form about women, but instead an exploration of the feminine by and for men. Zeitlin asserts that this psychodrama takes place through tragedy's use as a form for, as she says, exploring the self. The self that is really at stake is to be identified with the male for, with, with male, while the woman is assigned the role as a radical other, that's a quote. Tragedy for Zeitlin is a genre directly concerned with, quote, representation of a self as other than it seems or knows itself to be, a self with inner and outer dimensions. But this conceptual revelation is again implicitly gendered, feminized in the genre of tragedy in order to present the specifically male self, quote, with a deepened knowledge of his own labyrinthine interior life at curious and fascinating odds with itself. I think it would be a distraction to take apart this theorization of tragedy uh, uh, um, in general. So instead I'll highlight a couple of specific points that we might probe in this again, highly canonical text. The first is the interpretation of tragedy as a genre that is re relevantly about something called the self at all. That is to say, we could question, even drawing on so, lo lots of Zeitlin's other work, right? We could question or depart from Zeitlin's assertion that tragedy is a genre the tragedy as a genre is especially concerned with anybody's interior life of any gender. And since tragedy is a genre that is basically about the city or the state or human society or human society as it interfaces with the divine, it would make sense to depart from a reading of tragedy that inserts the drama into the individuated terms of basically psychological conflict. And this matters insofar as Zeitlin's central assertion in play, the playing the other essay is effectively that gender relations in tragedy, and indeed you can extrapolate to gender relations in Greek society more, more like beyond this, right? Take the form of men experiencing or playing at or indeed parodying. If she had written it in the 90s, she would have used the word parody because Butler popularized that, right? Um, indeed parodying the feminine in order to fuel their own sense of themselves. It is Zeitlin's choice to represent tragedy as a game played between self and other, and this choice in turn opens up a series of basically psychological questions about desire and repression, once again, right? As Zeitlin says in almost as many words, quote, tragic process conveyed through the, through the catalyzing person and actions of the feminine puts insistent pressure on the facade of the masculine self in order to bring outside that which resides unacknowledged and unrecognized within, <clears throat> a process that, she argues, results directly in pantheist's feminization. Note then that in casting the Baca in the psychological terms of this play between self and others, Zeitlin has more than 30 years before Carson centralized the robing scene within the dynamics of Euripides' play, right? That is a choice, okay? There are many ways to read Baca. Making the robing scene the crux of the narrative is only one, okay? It's a very dominant one currently, but it's only one. Uh, the narrative point of the Bacchae that produces its meaning is the point at which, for, for Zeitlin, is the point at which Pentheus is feminized. Zeitlin doesn't describe, as says Carson, this process of feminization in the anachronistic and precedent terms of trans identity, but she does present a theory of, of gendered social relations according to which men don female costume to learn more about themselves. Uh, uh, um, a kind of misogynistic social syntax from which women are excluded entirely. So that is just to say, Zeitlin offers an image of gender relations that both walks up to certain forms of gender desire, for instance, wanting to rearrange your body and social practices in such a way as to participate in gender otherwise, right? But she denies fully that such desires could come from any place except an aggressive and rapacious male subjectivity, parodying femininity for its own purposes of self-knowledge. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. 
she offers an image of gender relations that both walks up to certain forms of gender desire, like wanting to rearrange your body and social practices to participate in gender otherwise. But she denies that such desires could come from any place except an aggressive and rapacious male subjectivity, parodying femininity for its own purposes of self-knowledge. Now we can think about the date of publication of this essay in 1985. And this representation echoes, however distantly, not especially distantly, the thesis of the so-called radical feminism I brought up before, pursued aggressively in the 70s and 80s, that degendered trans women by attributing to them only the, the desire of a specifically male self to toy with femininity and feel male, femaleness for the gratification of their own, again, somehow substantially male desires. My claim, and this is the point where my, 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 my notes fall off, so I'm just going to talk. The claim, in other words, is that uh, 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 th this reading of Bacchae in psychological terms, in the terms of desire, in terms of Dionysus bringing forth what Pentheus really wants, where that reflects on what men really want, right, in tragedy, where tragedy is about what men really want, in this argument, right, um, and where this reflects more generally on, 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 on Athenian society, um, that this more or less, like, lays the conceptual groundwork for everything that Carson does uh, um, uh, uh, 32 years later. Okay, but it has not been recognized as such. Instead, it's been very canonized within classics. I can't think of a class I took on tragedy in undergrad or grad school where this was not either cited or, 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 or assigned. Okay, not a single one. Um, it's, and I mean, maybe that's, you know, it's been sort of what, five years now since I've taken a seminar on four years since I've taken a seminar on tragedy, but I'm going to guess that it's still the case, right? And, it, uh, uh, and I'd be curious to know if people have had a different experience. I'd be very interested in that. Uh, it might be the case that, you know, sort of going to school in the Northeast has, has in the Northeastern U.S. has particularly inflected my experience in this way, but I, but I suspect that I'm right. Um, Okay, why does this matter? So, so this is, a, again, it's an example, right? But it's an example of something that I'm referring to as a trend. It's important because right now in the university, lots of universities, not all, lots of universities uh, uh, have some kind of like super tokenistic, like like liberal, and I say liberal, I'm not, I, you know, like I don't mean liberal in, in a good way. I, 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 I mean, it di di diagnostically, right? Uh, 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 you know, like tokenistic, um, some kind of like trans inclusive policy, something something like this. You know, you'll see this from departments, you'll see it, you'll see it um, from, from universities, so say from some like diversity offices. I don't really know how it's like the specifics of how it's manifesting in the UK. I'd be interested to learn, right? Nonetheless, one of the things that I'm trying to point to is like so the, the overlap between this particular kind of liberal uh, uh, thinking, right, that uh, uh, expresses its sort of tepid or superficial support for trans identity and interests itself in uh, uh, forms of trans experience on the terms of scholarship, right? Uh, but when it interests itself in, in, in trans experience, it treats trans identity uh, as a spectacle, a curio, and a metaphor, okay? A spectacle and a metaphor. Um, Vivian Namaste, uh, who's a sociologist and, uh, and, 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 and uh, she's at uh, Concordia and a trans woman uh, and, and, and a really sharp writer who is very badly, who is very understudied, right? Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, has wrote in 2000, when she was writing about queer theory and she was she she diagnosed this trend in queer theory that is not just limited to queer theory right uh, uh, um, uh, whereby queer theorists take sort of thing like things that we can assign to spe specifically like trans feminine experiences uh, uh, on, on whatever some kind of spectrum and they use it as a metaphor for the relations of like gender or sexuality more broadly so, right so this is so so that's precisely the process that I'm talking about right taking trans experience as a spectacle and a metaphor Okay. The claim is that there is an overlap between this particular version of liberalism, which engages trans people as the objects and not the subjects of discourse, and the actual, and let's be real, fascistic logic that would like to see us like somehow exterminated, denied medical care, you know, uh, uh, forced into various forms of, uh, uh, of isolation, uh, uh, um, forced out of academic jobs, right? Uh, uh, and I say this as a currently unemployed, uh, academically unemployed person, right? I do not have an academic job because of COVID. I will not have an academic job. Like, let's just be real about this, right? Uh, uh, um, so, you know, like there is an overlap here. There is in fact a circuit 
um, between this kind of liberal theorizing that is licensed by the university and, and, and this partic these particular forms of far right uh, uh, um, politicization of trans identity. It is going on and under our feet. One of the ways that it, that it persists, not maybe not the most important one, but one of the places it persists is in classes. Um, and I think as we proceed, you know, as you know, most of you, I'm going to guess, are grad students. Some of you are, are advising grad students. Some of you are thinking about becoming grad students. So, you know, as we proceed with studies in sexuality and gender in the ancient world, the only way to not keep doing this is actually to be aware of things like the history of the theorization of trans identity in the 20th and 21st centuries. And the only way to do that is to read trans people, right? Um, you will not get it. I mean, and, and you know, and some other motherfuckers, right? But like, you, the, you will not get it uh, uh, simply by thinking that you, simply by thinking that you know something you don't know. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. I'm very grateful for your patience. I'm really looking forward to your questions. We both have muted here, me and Marcus, but I think we, we both wanted to say thank you so much. This this was really important. And yeah, um, we, we all needed to hear that, I think. And thank you so much for bringing, for this amazing talk. And uh, perhaps we can take, uh, we usually take, I know we didn't speak about this uh, before starting the talk, I'm really sorry, but perhaps we can take a 10 minute break before taking question, is that all right? Um, that is perfectly fine. Yes, absolutely. Break. Everybody take a break, you know, clear your head. I'm going to go have a cigarette. <laughs> cool. okay. So time to break and then we all reconvene at 5.50 maybe. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you.